the habits and the actions you have with money will outlast you. Margin gives you options. And options gives you freedom. You can't hate or rage your way to peace and prosperity. You work too hard for too long to live for the weekend. If you will live like no one else later, you can live and give like no one else. Well, we want you to begin to build wealth so that you can change your family tree. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dave Ramsey. you guys thank you thank you guys wow well is it too late in january to say happy new year yeah i mean 2023 is here thank you jesus i mean i mean we had 2020 and we thought well 2021's got to be better and it said no hold my beer oh my gosh you know and then 2020 it just it just keeps going it's amazing so we're so happy to have a brand new year, a clean slate, a fresh start, which is grace in its best form. You know, it's just, I get a new shot at this thing. And so when you Google, you know, people that, that Google dieting, for instance, at the beginning of the year, it's like 82%. Every, I mean, it goes way up. You know, just on a federal holiday, 10% do, right? Getting out of debt getting control of my money, learning to save money, all way up at the beginning of the year. Our hopes are up, but these are weird times. It's dark out there. It's scary out there. It's uncertain out there, and people are afraid. And I've been there. I know what it feels like to be afraid. And if you want to get healthy in these areas, life change in any area of your life, your marriage, your parenting, your spiritual walk, your money, is an intentional act. No one accidentally wins. Super Bowl will be in a few weeks, and at the end of the Super Bowl, there'll be confetti, and the reporter will run over and ask the guy, how did you win the Super Bowl? He never says, I just got off the bus. I don't know what happened. <laughs> it's an intentional act. Since he was six years old, He's been probably playing that position or something like it all the way up through college. And he's one of the few that gets out of college and goes to the big leagues, to the NFL, right? And actually gets to play at that level. It's not an accident to win. It's not an accident to be married today, 50 years. It requires extreme patience <laughs> and understanding, which is what my wife said for me to say, so I did. If you want to get healthy, it's an intentional act. No one accidentally gets in shape. If you want a great marriage, if you want a great, if you want to build some wealth so you can be outrageously generous, it's an intentional act. Over the years of teaching this stuff for the last 30 years, I've done a, spoken in a lot of different settings and Speaking of the NFL, I was speaking for an NFL team. Uh, they do a thing called rookie camp, and they bring in these rookies who are making more money than they've ever made in their lives, and their eyes are full of stars and dollar signs and Mercedes Benz and houses for their mama and so on, right? And they've got all these big ideas, and they have no idea that money's really not going to go that far. And so they bring me in to spray cold water on the whole idea because I'm good at it. So the first thing I explain to them is NFL stands for not for long. <laughs> the NFL, the average NFL career is 3.7 years. And 78% of them leave the league permanently physically disabled. And the divorce rate is fourfold the national average. And within 10 years, the bankruptcy rate is fourfold the national average. So it's not a great blessing when you hear those statistics, but you got a choice in the matter if you're the son, the daughter sitting there. It wouldn't be a daughter in this case, but I mean, if you're the guy sitting there, you've got a choice. So I finished the talk, walked him through the whole thing, all the Ramsey stuff that we talk about, common sense, what grandma said, what God says in the Bible about money, which turns out to be the same things, right? I finished the talk, and leaning against the back wall is this guy. Now, I don't I'm a football fan, but I, with their helmet, I mean, I know if they got their name on the back, I know who it is, right? 
but I don't know their, I mean, I pass them in the store, they're big, but I, I mean, you, you probably play football, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have no idea. And so, uh, but, but there's a guy at the back and he's like Hall of Famer, I recognized him, he's one of those guys. And he's lean, he snuck in the rookie camp, hear the talk, and uh, so I kind of called on him and he's obviously a veteran player and I said, so tell these guys, am I right? He goes, oh, you're so right. He goes, the number of you that'll be standing back here at the back of the room at my age is very small, so take advantage of the money while it's coming in. And he gave good follow-up talk, right? So I get to the end of it, and I'm talking to him back there because he was dead on, very articulate. And I was talking to this guy, a future Hall of Famer. I can't say his name because I don't have permission to tell the story. I didn't ask him. But it's still a great story, so I'm telling it anyway. But um, <laughs> I said, I, all that stuff aside, I said, I watch football, and... I'm a mediocre at best athlete in a couple of things, not at football, but I, 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 I just, I, I, as a fan, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, well, I, it's, you know, I may, it may be one of those weird fan questions. I'll warn you ahead of time. And he goes, it's okay. We're just, it's just me and you hanging out. We don't have to, if I tell you, if it's stupid, I'll just tell you. And I said, okay. I said, so you get paid like 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars a year, whatever it is, somewhere in there to do one thing, catch a football. How is it, pray tell, that when a, if you've ever seen a quarterback, if you stood on the sidelines of the NFL when they're throwing a football, it's so fast. If you've ever caught a football, it hurts terribly. They can total a car with a football. I mean, the speed is blinding. It's, it's a physical act. That's why those, oh, it's amazing. I said, so if he throws the ball so hard it drills a hole in your soul, it hits you in the numbers, and you're paid $25 million to catch a football, and that's your only thing you do in life. Why is it, how is it that you would drop the football? Because <laughs> as a fan, I'm going, you just hit him in the numbers. He goes, oh, that's easy. Happens all the time. I went, oh, good. He's not going to kill me. He goes, just two things. He said, both of them come, to do, come down to one thing. He said, it's loss of focus. And I said, okay, so what's the two things? He goes, well, that's the things that cause you to lose, cause you to lose your focus. Went, okay, this is getting philosophical. I like this. Probably theological. It'll probably preach. And he said, uh, he said so the first thing causes you to lose your focus is fear. He said, uh, he goes, I weigh 210, 220 maybe, six foot and some change. And when I go up after a ball, the guy that's going to hit me weighs three and a quarter, 375, and he is running at the speed of a Kia. <laughs> and when I, you know, have you ever heard, he said, Dave, you ever heard the announcer say, oh, he dropped the ball because he heard footsteps. He goes, that ain't a metaphor. You hear Sasquatch coming. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Fee, fi, fo, fum, boom, boom, boom. Crush, I'm gonna be in an ice bath tomorrow. And six massages later, I'm gonna try to walk out onto the practice field and try to get ready to do that again next week. He goes, and in a nanosecond, your brain tells you this is getting ready to happen, and you drop the football. <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> Fear causes you to lose your focus. He said, here's the other one. Have you ever seen the receiver, Dave, running down the field? There's nobody around him except the end zone is right there. He, the ball is coming, and he's looking, and he's got it, and he's like, I just got to catch it. And already in his mind, you see him, he's starting to do his touchdown dance, only the end zone's still there, and he hasn't got there yet. And he's, he, he's already, and he trips and falls or misses the ball because he's already in the end zone in his mind instead of finishing the job. He said, that's called greed. Greed will cause you to lose your focus. Fear and greed will cause you to lose your focus. Now, not greed like I want money, but greed like I'm celebrating something that I haven't yet earned. Fear, greed, these things will mess you up. When you sense disaster, when you've got fear, your brain shuts down. Dr. John Deloney talks about that all the time here at Ramsey. Your, the parts of your brain shut down because you are in fight or flight. You got to get out of the way. The car is getting ready to run over you. You don't need to have a discussion about what type of car it is. Is it electric? Is it a Tesla? I know. Get out of the road. Your brain shuts down. You do, your thinking skills, your higher thinking skills, your critical thinking skills go away and you 
flee so you don't get hit by the car. You don't get eaten by the saber tooth. That's where it comes from, that part of your brain, right? And, and so this idea that fear is okay, and we become fear junkies in this culture. Just look at the news channels. Everything is something to make you angry, greedy, afraid. Angry, greedy, afraid. These are not fruits of the spirit. Angry, freedy, fr angry, freedy, <laughs> afraid. Yeah, all that stuff, right? Can't even say it anymore, it's so bad. But this fear thing is real, and the numbers are devastating. And we've been fighting fear from COVID pandemic to quarantine and losing a job. First, we thought we were gonna die, then we thought we were gonna not have a job because some people thought we were gonna die. And then you couldn't get nothing, and then you could get everything, but it was all overpriced. And then you can't get nothing, but now it's overpriced again. And, and I, I'm never gonna get a house. I'm never gonna get a I don't get it. And, and we get in this crazed mode. The anxiety level is so high. And with that going on for so long now, we've gone through like three or four events back to back to back. Now we're in this inflation mess. We've got this divisiveness and this anger in this country where everyone's just, they cut people completely out of their lives because of who they think they might have voted for. It's nuts. People have lost their dead gum minds. There's no grace, there's no mercy, there, there's no kindness and gentleness. It's just, I mean, it's all driven by this fear, fatigue, and greed. And if you stay, if you stay afraid long enough, fatigue sets in. And General George Patton said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Tired people are short-tempered. Tired people aren't thinking clearly. Man, if I just get hungry, I get mean. <laughs> Much less hungry and tired. And then you put me in traffic with an idiot in front of me? Oh my <laughs> goodness. Are y'all that way? I mean, it, and, it, and, it, and this has just been amped up for about 36 months. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it's coming to a head in our culture and we need to address it head on. We need to say it out loud and go, hey, the emperor has no clothes. This is not good. This is, this is not good. As a people, we need to reset spiritually, emotionally, from our mental health standpoint, and it does revolve around our money, it revolves around wealth building. So I'm afraid I'm gonna go into a recession, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose a job, I'm afraid I'm gonna end up in a van down by the river. <laughs> so tonight, I'm gonna opt out, I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna get a little different perspective, different look, on things. How are Americans feeling about building wealth right now? Well, we just finished a huge survey with Ramsey Research and um, the numbers are, they're sad. The State of the union's not good. I mean, it's like 1992, it's the economy stupid. I mean, it really is. That's, this is what people are worried about. Eight in 10 Americans are worried about the economy. Inflation's at a 40 year high here in, 19, in, in 2022. The great resignation, People quitting their jobs, 3.98 million people a month quit their jobs in 2021. Oh, it gets better. 2022, four million a month did. And then if they didn't quit their jobs, they got fired. <coughs> Last year, Facebook laid off 11,000 people. Amazon laid off 10,000 people. Redfin laid off, uh, laid off 1,000 people. And down in uh, Mississippi, one factory closed, if you didn't read about it, back at uh, Thanksgiving. On Monday night before Thanksgiving, they sent out an email and laid off 2,700 people. They all went to work on Monday. When they got home Monday night, there was an email. You don't have a job anymore. They shut the whole factory down that night as if they didn't know before that day. Heartless, heartless. Salesforce, their stock has gone down 38%. In order to get their profitability up and their stock price off, start laying off people because their most expensive thing is people. And you can get your profitability up in corporate America anytime you want to just Lower your payroll, that's all you gotta do. Chop payroll, your stock price will go up. And guess what payroll is? Human beings with families and kids and mortgages and fears. And that's not right. That's not right. That's when corporate America's gone nuts. And the weird thing is corporate America can be small company, big company, the type of corporate America I'm talking about, the yucky kind. You can run a big company, it doesn't have to be run poorly. And it doesn't have to be done without taking care of people, it can be done. 37% of Americans are struggling or in crisis with their finances. That's 100 million people. 25% of Americans say they're relying on credit to make ends meet, boo. 
Four in 10 Americans say they have zero in savings. Half of Americans say the finances have a negative impact on their mental health. Four in 10 of you, when we surveyed you, said in the last year you have cried over your money or had a panic attack over your money. 40% physically cried. These are your neighbors. These are people you work with. And we lie. I mean, we lie in church. How's it going, Dave? Just fine. Car's going to be repoed Tuesday, but just fine. <laughs> we cover it up, but it's there. And, and then it boils up in the form of fatigue. It boils up in the form of fear. It boils up in the form of anger. It, it boils up in greed, looking for a shortcut. I'm watching a 23-year-old, 25-year-old living in his mother's basement on Tic Tac, and now I got a whole new clue on how to get money. <laughs> yeah, right. 82% of Americans are somewhat or extremely worried about their student loan payments, but don't worry, Joe Biden forgave them. Oh, wait a minute. Supreme Court said, hold my beer. <laughs> we'll see. So the numbers seem like they're stacked up against us, and this is a weird paradox. All of this negative fear and everything else around the whole idea of money and about our futures, and yet you cannot get a parking space at the mall or a reservation at a restaurant. That's a weird paradox. I mean, if you went to Walmart, you went to the, you know, even a high-end store, you got no idea that anybody's worried about the economy. They're in there spending like Congress. I mean, they are going bananas. And it's just this weird paradox, but these are the actual numbers. This is what's going on. So what happens in a situation like this is you get to the point you say, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. And my great friend, the fabulous motivator from a whole nother decade or two ago, Les Brown said, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's when you finally say the magic words of transformation. I've had it. When you have an I've had it moment, you are about ready to change your life. Changing your life is not an intellectual dance or some kind of theoretical idea. It's you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've had it. Then you will change. American Express called my house when we were going broke. I was 28 years old. Rachel was a brand new baby. My wife would have left, but she didn't have a car. <laughs> American Express called my house. We were going, we were so broke. It was awful. I had done every stupid thing, made Ramsey callers look like geniuses. I had done every stupid thing. And the guy calls my house and he's trying to collect $1,166.42 on an American Express bill. You know how I remember it? Because I got so mad. Because he asked my wife why she would stay with a man that wouldn't pay his bills. We don't do business with American Express 40 years later, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> Still, I was redneck hillbilly hopping mad, ready to drive Jacksonville, Florida, drag him out of his little cubicle and beat the snot out of him. <laughs> Because she called me at the office crying and said, he said, he said, he said, what, 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 what would, I, would I stay with a man who wouldn't pay his bills? And I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> That's funny now. Right then, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was mad. I'd had it. And I'm still mad 40 years later. And when I talk to one of you and your life has been broken over the knee of a credit card company or broken over the knee of Sally Mae or you've gotten yourself into a mess with your own stupid butt choices, same kind of stuff I've done in my life, I feel exactly that same kind of anger for you, with you, and sometimes a little bit at you. Get it done. Fix it. Get mad. It's time to change something. <laughs> And we got this thing going around the wussification of America where people are, I I'm struggling and I'm burnt out. You're not burnt out. I had a guy working for me, he goes, I'm burnt out. And I said, it's impossible, you're never on fire. <laughs> you're not burnt out. You don't have a plan you believe in. You don't think that when you do something, when you plant corn, you're going to grow corn. You don't believe that you're going to reap what you sow. 
And so you're sowing nothing or you're sowing sparingly and you're gonna reap sparingly or you're gonna reap nothing. Burnout right now is code for I don't have any hope because I don't know what to do and I feel stuck. Exhaustion is the exact same physical manifestation as burnout. Your body feels exactly the same when you're exhausted, but you're not burnt out when you're exhausted. You're just tired because you just worked your butt off towards a goal and you knew if you keep doing that long enough, you're gonna get the goal. You know, if I keep doing this, I'm gonna win. If I keep doing this, I'm gonna get there. And that's, you don't burn out when you got a why. You don't burn out when you're getting traction. You don't burn out when you paid off a debt last month and now you got three more to go. I'm not burnt out, I'm getting it. But when I don't think I can ever get out, no matter what I do, hope the government fixes my life, now you get burnt out. Because the government had never fixed anything. They can't even fix their lives, look at them. They're a dad blame mess up there, man. It's the island of misfit toys. Don't wait on them to fix your life. That's crazy. So ask yourself, why did I set out to build wealth in the first place? Well, when Sharon and I started, it's because we wanted to eat Friday. Y'all ever been there? And then once we got where we were eating pretty regular on Friday, one of her big goals was go to the grocery store and buy anything she wanted. She said, if I can just do that, I'll be rich. And uh, that was a long time ago. She can do that a lot now. We got financial peace. Life's good. It's 30 years later now after going broke. So that's the first thing. Then after that, you start going, hey, man, you know, maybe we can save up some money, and if there's an emergency, every time the tire's flat, it won't be a freaking crisis, you know? Wouldn't it be nice to have something happen and it be an inconvenience instead of a drama? And then once we get past that, then we could do this, and then we could do that, and, and man, we could change our family tree. We could make so much money, no matter how stupid our kids are, they could mess it up. <laughs> I mean, that's possible. I mean, well, some of you it's not, but I mean, it's <laughs> depending on the kid, I guess. But wow, some of them got exponential abilities there. But, <laughs> but you know, I want a better future for my family. I want to be able to give. I want to be able to give this much. I want to make an impact. Those around me, I don't ever want to walk up beside someone and I see that look, you see that look in their eyes? And I don't have the money to help them. I want to be able to just help them. I'm talking about that look, not the one who's begging, but the one's got that look like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so scared I can't breathe. And you put tires on a single mom's car and you fill her car with gas and you tell the mechanic to go through and make sure everything's fixed. The whole deal don't cost you $1,000. It changes her whole life because you don't have to think about it anymore because you've got your act together. This is when wealth building gets fun, y'all. This is when it gets fun. It's not a... It's not a shortcut. It's not a hack. There's no technique. There's, there's some principles. You follow those principles. They work every stinking time. And 100% of the time, they are hard. God and grandma were not in the business of lazy people winning. Grandma kicked some of your butts the way y'all act, standing around looking for something for nothing. I'm going to work from home and not <laughs> work while I'm at home, but get paid. That's called stealing. It's a different thing, y'all. This is old school stuff. But these principles are what brought us to this great place in this country, and abandoning them are a problem. We cannot abandon them. There's no secret. Live on less than you make. Change everything. When you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you say, I've had it, you look in the driveway and you go, 750 bucks a month? What was I thinking? Apparently, I wasn't. Car sold. What was that? I mean, you look over there, you go, I'm going to sell that. Kids are hiding by now. They're starting to think they're up for sale. <laughs> right? Some of you, when dinner time comes around, you don't know how to make anything except reservations. You might want to fix that. It's expensive. Not against restaurants, but broke people shouldn't eat out all the time. Hello. Why is this hard? It's not hard. Except the culture has been told they can do anything they want and there's no repercussions. Of course there's repercussions. Of course, when you violate the law of gravity, you're gonna go splat on the sidewalk, dummy. That's the way it works. I'm just, I'm, man, I tell you, I love getting people fired up on this because it sets them free. When you finally say, I've had it, it changes everything. My friend Jim Collins wrote a fabulous book on leadership called Good to Great. Many of you have read it, I'm sure. 
It's a classic by now, millions and millions of copies sold. And uh, one of the things he talked about in there was the Stockdale Paradox. And the way he got that phrase, Jim's a big researcher, was he interviewed the famous Admiral, Admiral Stockdale, who was a POW in Vietnam. Now, during the Vietnam era, the POW camp was in Hanoi, the Hanoi prison, which means hell's hole or fiery furnace. And uh, it was nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton, sarcastically, by the POWs, the prisoners of war. Many of the POWs were fighter pilots. They were shot down there, captured. Senator John McCain was one. He was there in solitary confinement two of the five years he was there. So in the Hanoi Hilton, it was a, uh, a place of torture. Prisoners were regularly tortured every day. They were starved to death. Many, many, many died. They were put in solitary confinement. They were beaten. They were suffering all the time. Stockdale was a commander when his plane was shot down. He was captured. He later, after coming home, became an admiral. He was in prison for eight years and tortured 20 times during that time. Incredible, horrific thing. Many strong men, many brave men did not make it out of the Hanoi Hilton. And when uh, Collins was interviewing Stockdale about this process, he was trying to understand the human spirit here. He said, how did you make it out alive? And Stockdale said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but that I would also prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Collins looked at him and said, well, who didn't make it out? And he said, oh, that's easy. The uh, optimists didn't make it out. The guys who said, oh, we're going to be home by Christmas, and then they weren't. Oh, we're going to be home by Thanksgiving, and then they weren't. We'll be home by Easter, and then we weren't. We'll be home by, and, then they, and they died of a broken heart. He said, this is the very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts in your current reality, whatever they might be. Collins calls this the Stockdale paradox. You are, have faith in the end of the story, but I'm going to convey, I'm going to face the brutal facts of what I have got to do to get to the end of the story. I've got to sell the car. I've got to work an extra job. I've got to learn a new word in my house, the ancient word. I'll teach it to you. You press your tongue towards the top of your mouth. You release it. You make a kissing motion with your lips. It sounds like this. No. <laughs> it's a powerful word. It will release you from this culture. No. No. You can say, no, I'm sorry, if you want to soften it. But at the Ramsey house, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> Even with the grandbabies, Papa Dave said, I'm that guy. I love you. <laughs> you will kill yourself. You cannot play with that. No. I'm here to protect you. You're small and dumb. No. <laughs> I love you more than life itself. No. No. And then you look in the mirror and you go, no, because adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. When I was going broke at 4 o'clock in the morning, I sat down in my recliner with my Bible and it flopped open randomly to Romans. And of course, it wasn't random. It was God going, hello. And uh, Romans 5, 3 through 5 Rejoice in your suffering. Now, I know many of you are reverent in your walk with the Lord, and I am most of the time, but right then I wasn't feeling really reverent. Rejoice in your suffering. And I went, no thanks. Don't think so. Kind of upset right this right now, and no thanks. I think I'm going to move on to another scripture. This one doesn't appeal. <laughs> Rejoice in your suffering. Keep reading. Because suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Hope comes from God. So in a land where we've lost our hope, and instead we're dependent on fear and anger and greed, we can step aside from that, step back, get a new perspective and say, I'm going to lean into hope. I'm going to confront the brutal facts of the mistakes I've made and the things I've got to do to undo them and the mess I have to clean up, but I'm also going to have faith in the end of the story because I've read the back of the book 
And ladies and gentlemen, we win. So I want to bring up a real treat for you tonight. One of our one of the top Ramsey personalities we've got right now. Everywhere he goes, people are just loving this guy. He's really on fire. He's a hard working dude behind the scenes, learned everything we're doing inside and out. He and my daughter Rachel have just launched a new uh, podcast that has gone explosive. The numbers are amazing. If you haven't listened to it, I listened to it this morning. It, one of them came out today called Smart Money Happy Hour. And it's two goofy guys and our two goofy people having a blast. And it's fun and funny, and there's information in there too. So you don't want to miss it. It's, it's good. They're very, very good, and you're going to really enjoy them. Please welcome to the stage, George Camel. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, thank you. Well, it is a big day for gingers. Any gingers in the crowd? That's rhetorical. We see you. It's very obvious. Na Na January 12th, National Kiss a Ginger Day. I cannot make this up. And I assume it was invented by just a real desperate ginger fella who needed a holiday just to get a little kiss. But January 12th is also special to me as a non-ginger. Exactly one year ago today, January 12th, 2022, my wife and I did our debt-free scream right up there on the Ramsey Show because we paid off our house. Thank you. Now, I'm not special, I'm not rich, I don't have a trust fund, I don't have a rich uncle, my uncle's broke. This was a journey for us. And uh, you know, just like getting to five foot six, it took a lot of time and hard work <laughs> to get here. The doctor says there's still hope. But here's what's crazy about my story. Over the past 10 years of following the Ramsey Baby Steps, I went from a negative net worth to a Baby Steps millionaire. That boggles my mind. So I am living proof that you guys can do this stuff too. You see, I'm a first generation American, which means I was born in the US, my parents were not. They came from the Middle East back in the 1980s. And so like none of you, I grew up Arabic Baptist. It's a real thing, you can Google it. And if you're wondering like what that's like growing up Arabic Baptist, imagine Baptist plus hummus. That's the recipe, delicious. So my parents quickly conformed to the American culture when they got here. And what does that mean? You conform to the money culture too, don't you? The one that says payments are normal, your FICO score is almighty, and college education is worth it no matter how many Sally Mae Monopoly dollars it takes to get there. And so naturally, I fell for those traps too. So by 2013, I found myself $36,000 in student loan debt, $4,000 in credit card debt. And here's me back in 2013. Check this out. Yeah, don't laugh. It's not a funny photo. Gosh. Well, behind that ever so gentle smile and that single use H&M cardigan was a guy who truthfully was frustrated and anxious and feeling a little bit hopeless. And here's why, like many of you, I did everything you were supposed to do, right? I was part of the generation that was told, if you work hard and you get good grades and go to the college that you want at all costs and get the credit cards for the cash back and the airline miles and the credit score and you wish upon a star that would make no difference who you are, anything your heart desires will come to you. Your dreams, dreams would come true, right? But it was a nightmare. Instead of a real boy, I turned out to be real broke. <laughs> Not what you want. Now, thankfully, Ramsey Solutions intersected my life that year. I landed a temp job here a decade ago, and I went through this money course called Financial Peace University. Y'all heard of it? Yeah. It's famous. It's famous, and it changed everything, y'all. In that course, my entire paradigm shifted. I learned that this, this money culture, this financial system, is actually designed to screw you over. Yeah, it turns out a life of payments makes banks and lenders rich, and they get fancy buildings and they sponsor stadiums and it keeps us broke. Amen. And I learned that if you wanna win with money, you gotta figure out what everyone else is doing and then run in the other direction. And that's what I did. 18 months later, going all in on these baby steps, I cut up the cards and I paid off $40,000 in consumer debt. I was debt free. Yeah. Felt so good. Now, can y'all imagine if I had waited in 2013, 10 years for student loan forgiveness? 
Well, you don't have to imagine, because 10 years later, I'd still be waiting. It's like that scene, Bueller, Biden, <laughs> Biden, nothing, nothing. Now, I want to show you the difference between 2013 George and the George of today. This is me and my wife paying off our house, and that is a different feeling right there. I turned up the smile, right? I got more joy. I have less anxiety with money. I have more hope for my financial future than ever. This stuff works, and you can do it too. You can go from negative net worth to millionaire, but you got to be willing to swim upstream, to be a little weird, to create to create the right money habits. That's what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. You came here because you want some hope that it's still possible to build wealth in today's America. But like Dave said, it's crazy times. Everything is still so freaking expensive. Inflation is out of control. And the last semblance of hope that we have is the Costco hot dog, still hanging on for dear life. <laughs> $1.50 for almost 40 years. But y'all know it's a trap, right? Because it's illegal to leave Costco for less than 150. That's a trap. But Costco aside, everything else has gone up and it's really got me down. I mean, y'all feel me, you know this. Life is good, right? We got contentment, we got gratitude, but it's been hard. For so many people out there, it's been stressful, money's been tight. You thought life would look differently by now. You thought you'd be in a different spot financially. And now it feels like you might never get ahead with money. And your money stretched thin, of course, thanks to inflation and payments and childcare and your lifestyle and your subscriptions and the list goes on. But that means you're feeling stretched thin too. And as I've been taking calls on the Ramsey Show, helping people with their money problems, a lot of the calls boil down to one main issue, margin. Too much month at the end of the money. That's the real reason they're stressed and out of control and anxious and feeling stuck and unable to pay for emergencies, unable to build wealth for the future. So what is margin exactly? Well, margin is breathing room, right? In your bank account and your life. It's knowing your card's not gonna get declined at the grocery store. It's having money left over, abundance to give, to save, to spend. And margin is also the key to maximizing your number one wealth building tool, your income. So how do we get this margin? Well, it takes a little bit of math. Here's the formula for margin. It's going to blow your mind. Get this. Spend less plus make more equals margin. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Now, let's be honest. This is easier said than done. If it was easy, we'd all have it, wouldn't we? It takes sacrifice. It takes some compromise. It takes living on less than you make. It takes getting out of your comfort zone. So I want to share three key steps to create margin so that you can actually build wealth. The first step is to start a zero-based budget. Now, if your income is your number one wealth-building tool, your budget is second. Why is that? Well, it allows you to get your spending under control and create a habit of saving. And a budget is just telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. And get this, when people start Financial Peace University, they start budgeting, they're using every dollar. On average, they find $350 in their budget, in their first month of budgeting. That was just floating away from them. They took control. When you do a budget, you will feel like you got a raise. You don't need an awkward conversation with your boss. And it turns out when you pay attention to your money, it starts to behave, doesn't it? Self-control and discipline. That's what budgeting is. It's just adulting with your money. Now, if you're married, you've got to be doing a budget together. This is a team effort like folding fitted sheets. Nobody should attempt it alone. It's too dangerous. Now, earlier, I told you my wife and I, we paid off our house, and there's no way we could have done this without being on the same page. We reach our goals so much faster when we work with our spouse, not in spite of them. It's one of the main calls we get on The Ramsey Show. How do I get on the same page with my spouse? Well, it takes hard conversations. It takes actually having a vision for your marriage instead of wondering what's happening next weekend, thinking about what you want the next five years to look like. It takes going through Financial Peace University to create common language and shared goals around money. And here at Ramsey Solutions, we've got the best budgeting method out there. It's called a zero-based budget. This is where your income minus expenses equals zero. Let me show you what this looks like. Let's say we make $4,000. We list our income on one side. That's all the paychecks for the month. The other side is all of our expenses. So go through that bank statement 
and take your best guess at what that month is going to look like, and it should come down to zero. You'll notice right now, we got money left over. Our expenses are 3,600. So with that extra 400 bucks, we gotta give that a job, otherwise it's gonna float away into Uber Eats and DoorDash and Target. And so we're gonna apply that 400 bucks to our baby step. We're trying to get out of debt, great. Now we've got a zero base budget. Every dollar has a job. We don't like our dollars unemployed, right? Now we have a free app called Every Dollar that makes this super easy. You download it, you set up your budget in minutes, you track it throughout the month, and that is the way it works. Now, once we get the budget going, the second step to creating margin is to get out of debt. Turns out it's real difficult to build for the future while still paying for the past. You're getting tugged in two directions. Don't wonder why you can't build wealth when you got payments up to your eyeballs. The credit card bills, the car payments, your student loan payments, yes, they are coming back regardless of how long Uncle Joe kicks the can down the road. So here's an exercise. If you're not mad at your debt and you're like, well, my payments are comfortable, here's a fun exercise for you. Add up how much you pay in payments every single month. Now, add up the interest you're paying every single month. Now, multiply that by 12 months. Now you wanna punch me, you're so angry. Please don't. Debt is robbing your paycheck, it's robbing your joy, and it's robbing your ability to build wealth. And for most people, debt is truly the biggest roadblock to building wealth. We can complain about inflation and the economy and the White House, but when we look at our house and we look at that guy in the mirror and you look at his payments, that's the real reason. And that's why we're gonna get completely debt-free using the debt snowball method. It's the same method I use to pay off 40,000 in 18 months. Here's how it works. We list out all of our debts from smallest to largest, regardless of the interest rate. If y'all were so good at math, we wouldn't be in debt, would we? We're focusing on progress here. We want quick wins. So we're gonna attack the little debt with a vengeance. With all the margin we can have, we're selling stuff, we're cutting expenses, rolling that payment into the next one, into the next one. The Subaru's getting paid off. Sally Mae's evicted. We are debt free. (laughs) Just like that. It's that simple and it's that hard. Because you gotta realize, oh, my little plan of moving the car to the 0%, that's not actually doing anything. We gotta get out of debt. We can't just move it around. So once we're out of debt, we're budgeting, we can move on to the third step to creating margin, which is get that emergency fund. So once you're debt free, it's your next priority. Three to six months of expenses in a rainy day emergency fund. And notice I said expenses, not income. So look at your living expenses. What do you need to survive for a month? Multiply that out. And this is really a buffer between you and life so that you never have to go into debt again. You're wondering, how does this help me create margin? Well, it keeps you from going back into debt, which helps you keep the margin you worked so hard to create. So let's define emergency real quick, because some of y'all get it twisted, because you get uh, a sale to your favorite store in your email, and you're like, it's an emergency. They'll never do 30% off again. (laughs) And by the way, upgrading to the latest iPhone, not an emergency, unless you're an Android user, in which case... It might be an emergency. (laughs) It might be. I don't know. And that is how you lose half the crowd. You're welcome. (laughs) So those are the three steps to creating margin. And we got to remind ourselves, why are we doing this? To reduce money stress and put ourselves in a position to build wealth. Now think about where you are for a second. If you do all those three things, you've got a consistent monthly plan for your money. You've got no payments and you have 10, 15, 20, $25,000 in the bank for emergencies. Breathe that in. (sighs) No amount of meditation or goat yoga will give you that kind of zen. (laughs) That is why we call it financial peace. You make decisions differently. You give differently, you spend differently. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, George, you just did that in three seconds. This sounds gonna take forever. I got a lot of debt, man. I don't make that much. How am I gonna do this? Well, I'll tell you, when you go all in on this plan, here's the timeline for how long it takes on average. Baby step one is a starter emergency fund of a thousand bucks. People do that in 30 days max because we are selling stuff, we're working side jobs, we're cutting expenses down to nothing to get that thousand bucks fast. Second, the baby step two, getting out of the consumer debt, it takes people 18 to 24 months on average with that gazelle intensity. Baby step three, fully funded emergency fund, six months on average to get that saved up. So think about this, two, two and a half years of short-term sacrifice to build an incredible foundation for long-term wealth building. Now we're actually ready to build wealth. 
Baby step four, we start investing 15% of our household income in retirement. Now, I'm gonna keep it real simple here because a lot of your friends out there think their whole life insurance plan they wanna sell you is an investment vehicle. And they think crypto is an investment vehicle. And the single stock that's gonna take off and go to the moon is an investment vehicle. No, it's this simple. All you need to build wealth is a 401k and an IRA. In 2019, Ramsey Solutions did the largest study of millionaires ever done, over 10,000 of them. And here was a shocker. The number one investment vehicle to become a millionaire was a 401k plan. It's that boring and it gives me that much hope that I can do it too. And here's a five word investing strategy that sums up everything we believe in, at Ramsey about investing. Match beats Roth beats traditional. So let's walk through that. For starters, you're gonna invest up to the match if you have one in your 401k. Or if you're military or government, you might have a TSP. If you're a teacher, you might have the 403b. The match is a 100% return on your investment. You put in four, they match four. Take that first. That's amazing. It's an awesome benefit to have. Thank you, HR. We love you. They don't get thanked a lot, it turns out. <laughs> Usually, they just get complaints about Gary and shipping, so they could use a win. <laughs> so if you have the option of a traditional 401k, we're investing up to the match, then we're going to move on to Roth options. What does Roth mean? It's real simple. You're using after-tax dollars that grow tax-free. We love that. You got a million dollars in Roth at retirement, you get a million dollars without Uncle Sam touching it ever again. So we're gonna max out a Roth, and if we're still not at 15% yet, we're gonna go back and invest in that workplace retirement plan until we get there. And if you have a Roth 401k, we love that. You can just invest all 15% there if you want. That's wonderful. So no matter where you are in your wealth building journey, I recommend working with a financial advisor. I've got one, Dave has one. You need these people in your corner not only to coach you through the ups and downs to keep you from jumping off the ledge, but to help you understand what you're investing in. Don't do this blindly. You can connect with one all over the country at RamseySolutions.com. They're fantastic, and they give me so much confidence in my wealth building journey. And now here's what's amazing to me. In most retirement accounts, 90% of the balance is growth when you get to retirement. That is the power of compound interest. Here's what that means. You put in 10% is what you contributed. The rest was compound interest, that money making you more money over time. And you need a long-term mindset to build wealth and keep it. We are not in this thing to get rich quick. The wisest and wealthiest guy of all time, Solomon, said this in Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. That's fire. I mean, he would have crushed it on Twitter, let me tell you. <laughs> and he could definitely afford that monthly payment for the blue check. I, well, I'm just gonna say that. That's the strategy, right? Invest consistently, steadily over a long period of time. So from what I just told you, uh, wealth building really isn't that glamorous. It's actually pretty boring. And that gives me hope because I'm pretty boring too. I like it like that. You know what's not boring though? Having no money stress, retiring with dignity, having a few million bucks in the bank instead of trying to survive off of social insecurity. So let's look at what this looks like in real life. We're gonna take a couple, Joe and Susie, 32 years old. They just went through Financial Peace University. They're all in on the baby steps and it takes them three years to go from baby step one through baby step three, getting out of debt, get the emergency fund. So now, where are we at? They're 35 years old in baby step four, investing 15% of their income. Let's say they make $65,000 as a household. That's actually below the median household income of 70. Now let's say they start investing at 15% into mutual funds in their Roth 401k. That comes out to about a little over 800 bucks a month, little under 10 grand a year. And by the way, that 800 bucks a month exists because Joe and Susie created margin in their finances by getting on a budget and getting out of debt and having money set aside for emergencies. So now let's pretend they don't even get an employer match, all right, which is unlikely because most employers have one. And they work their whole lives making that below average household income and they never get a raise for 30 years. Do better, Joe and Susie, right? <laughs> now, the point of investing is, of course, to make money. And in a few minutes, Rachel Cruz will be out here talking about how you actually make money in the stock market. She's gonna ease your fears around investing. But let's run some numbers out and see what Joe and Susie's accounts will look like investing at 800 bucks a month over 30 years with average returns of 10 to 12%. So 10% return, they would have $1.8 million tax-free at retirement. Pretty good, right? Yeah. 
Let's bump it up to 11%. Let's be a little optimistic. 2.2 million bucks. Now let's shoot for the stars and say they get the average return 12%. $2.8 million. How much of that did Joe and Susie put in? Less than 300 grand. The rest was compound interest, and it only happened because they did this over a long period of time. Now, we can argue about expense ratios and whatever y'all want to nerd out about, but you got to admit, even if I'm half wrong on my assumptions, I'm not, you'd still be a Baby Steps millionaire. But here's what's more likely to happen in reality. Joe and Susie's income will go up, right? Which means they're going to increase investing because of that. They're going to get the employer match, which means they're going to get free money. They're going to pay off their house early following the Ramsey baby steps in about 10 to 15 years. And that house is going to appreciate in value over that period of time. Oh, and by the way, once the house is paid off, they can increase investing, which means they're going to have way more money than what I just showed you. But beyond the financial benefits, here's what they'll experience too. A marriage that's more likely to last because they're on the same page with no money fights and money in the bank. They're going to be more fulfilled in their careers because they'll free to make decisions without needing that next paycheck. They don't have to deal with that toxic boss. They just walk out of there and find a different job. They also become more generous because they have the margin to be. So when friends or family or their community needs help, along with thoughts and prayers, they can also <laughs> leave an envelope of cash at the door. How cool would that be? Don't you want that kind of life? That was rhetorical. Of course we do. That's what it looks like when you decide to rise above this broken financial system and follow a proven plan. If you want to change your future and you want to build wealth, you got to turn off the noise. You got to turn off the news. You got to focus on creating the right money habits, focus on your house. So let's go back to this tale of two Georges. It's good to look back. It's good to remember that wealth building is a journey and that cardigans will hopefully come back around. <laughs> and 10 years for a lot of you might sound like a long time. I don't get that kind of time. Well, guess what? It's going to be here whether you like it or not. So what are you going to decide to do that you're going to look back 10 years from now and be grateful you did? And here's what happens, right? We've all done the New Year's resolutions. Most people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, but they underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. So my hope for you tonight is that you decide to do the same plan that I did, that you discover the belief that you can do this. Because it turns out the little man still can get ahead in America today. Don't laugh. Thank you. And it's not just me. It's you. It's the big men too. But it starts with creating margin, that breathing room in your finances. And it is a different way to live when you create that margin in your life. And here's what I found. Margin gives you options. And options gives you freedom. And freedom gives you peace. And peace, that gives you joy. And all of that leads to a more meaningful life, a life well spent. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, earlier, I mentioned the stock market can be a wild ride. You might not like what you see when you look at the 401k. And good news for you, our next speaker is going to give you the stock market survival guide to ease your worries. She's a best-selling author, host of The Rachel Cruz Show, co-host of The Ramsey Show, and her finest career accomplishment to date, my co-host on our newest podcast, <laughs> Smart Money Happy Hour. So, would you help me welcome to the stage my friend, Rachel Cruz. Thanks, George. Great job. Great job. Hey, guys. Okay, so if I didn't have this job, if, if talking about money, teaching about money wasn't my job, there's a couple other things that I have in my life that I'm like, you know what, I feel like I would be pretty great at. Uh, one would be a political correspondent for a network. I love politics, so I'm like, I could totally, I could do that. Uh, I could be a sleep trainer for babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic at getting babies to sleep. Uh, or a travel agent. And I love vacations. I love traveling. This is like a spiritual gift of mine, okay? So when our family is booking a trip and planning a trip, I'm like, I am all in. Or if we, if we go on like a girl's trip or a couple's trip, like I, it's travel agent Rachel is what everyone calls me. And they're like, oh, is travel agent Rachel here? I'm like, oh, she's here. She is here. 
And I just love it. I love the details. I love looking at the flights and the hotels. I love making dinner reservations, researching the restaurants, what we're going to do. I make an itinerary. Like, it's just, it brings me life. I don't know. So last year, we decided to take our two girls. We have three kids, but we decided to take the two oldest, the two girls, to Disney World. And I, and Disney, it's a, pl- it's a planning kind of trip, right? So I am like working in my gifts. I'm like, this is what I was created to do. And so as we're planning the trip, I mean, I'm on my laptop every night, uh, researching, looking at, the, looking at the hotel, figuring out, okay, which way should we get to the park? Do you take the tram? Should we walk? The buses? I mean, I'm making a her schedule. I mean, I am, I am all in. Even to the point, <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it's true. I would go on YouTube and watch random families and their trips to Disney. <laughs> I was like, the, when someone's like, what are you watching? I'm like, the Millers from Ohio. <laughs> but I'm like watching their trip. I would watch the roller coasters. I would watch the roller coasters. I would sit there and watch videos of every roller coaster at Disney World. I measured my girls so I knew what their, how, you know, how tall they were to figure out which rides they could go on. I mean, this is an all-in thing. You gotta understand, all-in. And so I realized in my planning that there were two roller coasters that... My middle one, Caroline, it was not tall enough to ride, but Amelia, our oldest, could. Space Mountain. Yeah, I knew I was going to have a Disney fan here. And Everest. So Everest is a pretty intense roller coaster in Animal Kingdom. So that day came, we're in Animal Kingdom. Caroline, there's just tears that she can't ride it, and we're showing her the measurement, like, sorry. So Winston takes her off, and, and it's me and Amelia. And thankfully, my kids love roller coasters, you know, girls after their own mom's heart. I just love it. And so we're in the little queue and you're going through and, and Disney's pretty great. I mean, they're pretty creative, right? So you're looking around at all the artifacts and, and you're getting to the line and, 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 and Amelia's like, oh, mom, I just, I just want to get on now. And I'm like, I know, me too, me too. Like, I just, like, we're so excited. Well, there's a girl in front of us. I mean, I say girl, probably mid to late 20s. And, and, and I see her and she's kind of doing this. And suddenly she turns around and she just looks at us and she looks at me and she's like, <sighs> I was like, oh, uh, and she looks at it in a million. And she goes, oh, and she stops and she's and to my seven year old and she said, if you can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and Amelia was like, yeah, you can, you got this. And I was like, you've got this, you've got this. So we get to the front, you know, you're at the gates and the, the people get off the coaster, you get on, you buckle up. I'm buckling Amelia, making sure she's all good. And it begins. And if you've been on that one specific roller coaster, it kind of just, it's kind of nice at first. You kind of go around the bend and you kind of go up a little hill and it's like, oh, and you're, okay. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, right. And it's like the classic roller coaster mountain that everyone's on. And we're going up and, and, and it's to the point that I'm like, I'm a full grown adult who pays taxes. Like I'm, I'm a human and an adult, a grown up, a mom. But you start like questioning every life decision that you've made until this point. And we're going up and I'm like, okay, this is gonna be good. And I hear from right in front of us, the girl in line scream at the top of her lungs, get me out of here. <laughs> and Amelia looks at me, she's like, I can't wait. And I was like, I know. <laughs> and then you go to the top and it begins. <sighs> but I will say, that little tipping point right there in life was us and the stock market last year, where everyone is questioning every life decision you've made to this point. And, and with this coaster, you know, the roller coaster ride, everyone enters the market even differently, right? Some people are excited and enthusiastic, maybe a little um, naive, like Amelia, my seven year old, you know, just jumping right in. Some people are very fearful, very cautious. Uh, You know, everyone kind of enters differently. But let me tell you, it's a ride. It's a ride. And when it comes to building wealth, the market, you guys, George said it earlier, but it's one of the most consistent ways to build wealth over time. But man, it's a ride. So you got to hang on and you have to stay on the ride. And the problem is, is that fear can take over, can't it? Right, you're watching the news, you're, you're, you're reading posts on Facebook and you're kind of thinking, oh my gosh, am I crazy? You know, is this the right thing? And you start questioning everything and fear can just take over. So I wanna walk through, how do we face our fears when it comes to the market? Because the truth is, if we wanna build wealth, it really is one of the best ways, one of the most effective ways to build wealth over time. So the first way to kind of face 
your fear of the market is, is to face the fear. It's just simply that. And what's hard is when you're watching the news, I feel like they want you to be scared of everything, right? They're like the jobs report, the housing market, the stock market, oh my gosh, it's everything. And you're kind of thinking, I think the world's gonna end, right? You get to this point and you're so fearful. And when your fear is not specific and it's just ge general, you can be paralyzed by it. So when it comes to being fearful of the market or, or from the economy, be very specific. What am I afraid of? Am I afraid because we're living paycheck to paycheck and it's terrible, right? Am I afraid because inflation, I'm feeling it. Am I afraid because I genuinely was gonna retire this year and looking at my 401k, I may not be able to. Are you fearful of, of the job market because your company is laying off people, right? Like be very specific about your fear. Don't let it be this general idea that I'm scared of the economy. Be very specific and then control what you can control. We have said that phrase, a thousand billion times, it feels like over the last two years here at Ramsey, but that's the truth. Control what you can control, which means there's not a lot of things in life that we can control. The older I get and the more therapy I do, <laughs> the more I realize that's true, right? There's not a lot that we can control, but with our money, we can control our income. When it hits our bank account, we get to make decisions, right? We get to decide, am I gonna spend it? Am I gonna pay off debt? Am I gonna invest? What am I gonna do with that? If you are in the market, you have control to say, am I gonna stop investing? Am I gonna continue to invest? Am I gonna pull money out? You have options there. So, so figuring out what you can control is so, so key. So facing your fear head on. Number two, overcome your fear with facts. This is gonna help you. So we're gonna get a little nerdy here. This is like stock market 101, are you ready? Okay, let's just talk about the stock market. What is the stock market? The stock market is a market of stocks, which are tiny pieces of ownership in public companies that you and I get to buy into. They're bought and sold, that, those shares. And so we get to be investors. Everyday people like you and I get to be investors in the economy. And that's amazing. So that's what the stock market really is. And what happens with the stock market is you can watch it, and you can see, okay, the activity and the perceived values of those shares go up and down based on really how people are feeling in the world. It's that, okay? So when people are feeling great, and they're like, oh yeah, life is awesome, we're, we're shopping, we're buying stuff for our kids, we're going on vacation, we're going out to eat, we're buying new cars, we're buying, like we are just spending and doing great. Well, guess what? When you spend money to companies, the value of those companies go up, so the the values, the perceived values go up and everything's great. But when fear comes in, uncertain times, maybe a pandemic, maybe a war, maybe an election season, maybe a bad jobs report comes out, but something happens and everyone's like, ooh, this feels unstable. So I'm gonna contract and not spend as much. I'm gonna hold my money and we're gonna be a little bit more conservative because we don't know what's going on. Well, when people are not out spending money, the values of those companies, perceived value kind of goes down, so you see that happening, right? I mean, it is, it is a living organism is what it feels like, right, the stock market. I mean, it is a living, breathing thing, and you can watch it. There's even channels, you know, on cable news that you can turn on and literally watch in real time the mar and, what, and what it's doing. Like, it's just, it's wild. And so what's happened recently is yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're feeling that downturn. But you go back a few years, you guys, um, you know, there's a thing, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So you go back to March of 2020, which feels like 20 years ago, doesn't it? Go back to March of 2020. Okay, the market fell 9.5%, you guys, in one day. It was the worst day for the market since Black Monday in 1987. Okay, so it... it it tanked March of 2020, right? COVID, I mean, it's, it's when COVID hit everything, right? You're feeling it. So what's wild is when you watch the market and you look, you see, okay, yeah, it dove and everyone kind of freaked out and panicked. Well, August of that year, a few months later, it returned. And then if you remember in 2021, we actually ended 2021 uh, breaking records. The S&P broke a record. I mean, it just, it, it, it was great. 2021 was, was insane for the markets. And then here comes 2022, right? And it goes back down. So again, 
It's, it's this feeling of up and down. But what I want to encourage you, where we're at right now, if you're looking at your mutual funds, if you see your 401k, if you're in the market, you know it's not great. It's not great. Winston and I, we have a mutual fund. And he put, this was just, I mean, I think it was last week. And he was like, oh, look at this. And I looked, I was like, oh, don't, don't, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Because it, it is, it, it's been really tough. It's been really, really hard. But here's the deal. When the market goes down like that, you guys, that is the time to continue to invest. Invest consistently because it's on sale. That's what happens. It's on sale. What $1,000 would have bought you in 2021, how many shares right here? Well, in 2022, you get to buy a whole lot more for the same amount of money. And here's the beautiful thing. When you're buying at the, at the bottom, as it continues to go up, which I believe it will, I believe in the American economy enough to believe that it will go up. You'll watch it, you'll watch it go back up. And you then, if you're in the market and you're on baby step four, you get to build out, you get to build that value back and you get that, that, that money. You get to watch your money grow with it. When people are fearful and they don't wanna invest, they try to jump in when it's getting good and they've missed all that growth. Okay, so in the, investing consistently, you guys, is so, so key. And again, 2022, or yeah, I look back last year and I'm like, you know, on the Everest ride, the roller coaster a million I were on, there's a part if you've been on it and you get to this dead end and it's like these fake tracks that go nowhere and you're like, where do we do? Where do we go? Oh, we're going backwards. And you go backwards into this dark tunnel and you're like, I have no idea what's going on in life right now. You know, that's, that's kind of what it felt like. But staying on the roller coaster and not jumping off is what keeps you safe and staying on it and riding it out. Okay, so I mentioned the S&P 500 um, and George has been talking about the market as well. So when you look at something like that, again, there's these words that are thrown out in this, in this topic, uh, things like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, and it's like, what is this? Well, I, I like looking at the S&P 500 because basically what it is, it's a, it's a stock index. And so it's basically a measuring stick that shows how the overall economy is doing because it's the S&P 500, which means it's the 500 largest publicly traded companies is what the S&P 500 is watching. So you get a good picture because what makes up that are, are companies like Delta, Hershey's, uh, Home Depot, American Airlines, Netflix, Nike, my favorite, Target. Hmm the black hole of goodness. I mean, it's just great, right? So it's these large companies that you're watching. And when you look at the history of the markets, because that's also important to know, okay, if we're in it and we're, not in a, we're in a fearful time and it doesn't look good, what does history show us? Well, history shows us that the, annual, the average annual return since 1928 through 2021 was 11.82%. Okay, that, that was the average. And what I like to look at that is I like to see the overall big perspective of the market. Because again, if you're in it, it's scary right now. It's not fun. But that's because we have a short-sighted view if we're just looking at the present. So that's why backing up and, and seeing the pattern of what it's doing is really important to your wealth building. And I love patterns in life because when you, when you know that something is kind of predictable, you're like, okay, that gives you a little bit of safety, you know, a little bit of peace. Uh, our youngest is three, and we tried potty training like two months ago, and it was just a disaster. Boys, I don't know what this thing is, but I'm like, y'all are, are crazy. Potty training a boy is so hard. So I just gave up. I'm just lazy, and I'm like, you'll figure it out. It's fine. We'll find it. <laughs> so I can tell you, it's kind of gross. Your parents will understand. But during his nap, when I go get him up at 3.30, there's a pattern that he poops. Every nap, I walk in, and it stinks, his room. It's predictable. I know, I'm not shocked, I'm prepared, and I know the pattern, right? If you go to Chick-fil-A, you can be pretty sure that your order is gonna be right. Jesus chicken always just proves well, right? <laughs> so there's a pattern that you can count on. So patterns are really helpful, and when we're looking at the market, seeing patterns can give us peace. So let's just do a little example. Let's just look to see the last five years when it comes to the S&P 500, just to see this graph, okay? So 2018, so you're seeing it up, right? 2021, we talked about was a really great time, and then it went down, okay? And then let's zoom out again, 10 years. Okay, so you're seeing it, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. See that roller coaster ride? 30 years, up, down, and that, see that 
uh, the 2008 right there, all the way, right? The Great Recession, all of that. Okay, and then let's go, let's go 100 years. Okay, so that's, that's the market, right? Up here is where we are. And what I, when I look at this, and for wealth building to know what, what, how do I wanna build wealth, to me, I look at it, I'm like, there's a pattern, right? There's a trajectory of it going up. Yes, it does this, and it's insane, and it's nuts, but overall, you can see that pattern that it continues to go up. And so that's why I have confidence. I do, I still have confidence in the market, and that's why we're still investing and building wealth. Again, this is such a, a huge key, and, and the reality is, too, where the S&P is today, as we're doing this live stream, is higher than where it, than where it was in 2019, pre-COVID, okay? So... Again, it feels insane. It feels like, oh my gosh, it's up and down. But really, when you look at the numbers, it gives you peace. So when it comes to building wealth, we wanna face our fears. We wanna get the facts, learn some new stuff, hopefully to have some peace and safety with our building wealth. And then the third thing of overcoming is just to keep investing. I'm telling you guys, Consistent investing is what is going to help you build wealth. The survey that we did with Net Worth Millionaires found that investment consistency was the second most important factor to building wealth, is what they would say. The first was financial discipline. And what's fascinating too is they, they studied the net worth millionaires and then they studied the general public. The general public said investing consistency was the seventh most important thing to do to build wealth. So millionaires, General public, right? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go over here. Investing consistently is so key. So if you are out of debt, if you have a fully funded emergency fund, funding your retirement, that 15% of your income into retirement, you guys, is still important, even in a down economy. Keep at it. And if you're a first-time investor, maybe you're at the point that you are on baby step four. You've fully funded your emergency fund. You're on this journey and you're a little bit gun shy. Get in, get in, get in and do it. Because over time, that is what's going to help you build wealth. So, so how do you invest, though, in a down economy? Because a lot of people are asking that, okay? So I want to invest. So, so what does that look like? Number one rule, diversify. Don't go single stocks. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify. Mutual funds within your 401k is great. Spreading your money around. I know it sounds boring and it's not exciting, you guys. But again, look at the pattern. Look at the consistency and do what, what, what has a rate of return that we know of, okay? So mutual funds is a great place. And then number two, you write it out. Write it out. Continue, continue to invest, again, even if it's down. Uh, Warren Buffett has a great quote, and he said, be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. Greedy, I don't really like that word. It's not a great word, but... I like the idea because you remember last year, crypto was like the big thing, cryptocurrency. Everyone's like, oh yeah, get into Bitcoin, all this. So you're gonna make so much money, you're gonna make so much money. And there's so much hype around crypto. And there was a little bit of that greed of like, get in quick, yeah, get rich quick. When, there, when that stuff is happening, you guys, be a little fearful, right? Get back and be like, mm, let's see how this plays out. It hasn't played out great <laughs> for them. <laughs> and then when people are fearful right now, they're freaked out, they're pulling their money out, they're stopping investing, they're freaking out, that's when you know to jump in. And so don't freak out, don't jump off the ride, continue to invest. And again, that perspective, the long-term perspective is going to help, it really is. So facing your fear, getting the facts, keep investing, and just know this is for the long-term. This is for the long-term. And it's hard to have that perspective sometimes. You know, even with my three kids, we're like in the thick of it. They're three, five, and seven. And it's, it's just a lot, you know? You're just like, wow, there's a lot of humans in our home. It's what it feels like. And you'll, you know, you'll meet these people at the grocery store, great intentions, but they're like, oh, I just sent my youngest to college. Enjoy every second. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Are you changing diapers at 3.30 every day? Are you? No, no, you're not. And, and I'll be honest, I'm like, okay, I know that. I know it's true. You know, the days are long, but the years are short. You know, it's on a coffee mug. You know, I, I get it up here. But some days I'm like, yeah, no, I want them like changing their own clothes and stuff. Like we, we, wanna, we wanna keep moving along, right? 
And so I don't have that perspective. I'm in the thick of it. And so that's how the market is again. Remember, having step back and have that big perspective. And so when Amelia and I, when we ended the Everest ride, uh, they, they brought us down, you know, you get out and it's like, the gates open and people kind of clap or they're laughing, all of this. And we get out and Amelia was like, I want to do it again, mom. I want to do it again. I'm like, we're not standing in that line again. We're not standing in that line again. And so we're walking out and the girl in front of us, I remember she looked back at us and she goes, oh, well, wasn't as terrible as I thought. And I thought, you know what? I, I think 65-year-old Rachel is going to say that about her investing. <laughs> that was a ride. That was a ride. There were some scary moments. But you know what? Oh, it just It wasn't as bad as I thought. That's my prayer. So again, you guys, this whole building wealth idea, when it comes to investing, it's boring. It's not exciting. Like George said, I, I wish I had this like fun, flashy formula that no one's ever heard of. But it's the consistent investing that's really going to help you build wealth. And you build wealth not just to stock up money and you know, keep it all, right? Like there is a true intention of your why. Why are you doing this? Changing your family tree, being generous. I mean, there's amazing stuff that money can do. Money is a tool to create a life that you love. And building wealth does that in scale. So thank you guys so much. I wanna welcome back to the stage, my dad, Dave Ramsey. All right, give it up for Rachel and George one more time. Woo! Well, there are a lot of lessons from what we've all walked through as a culture, from uh, the quarantine and the COVID process and then the things and the issues following. But for sure, regardless of what side of some of those issues you sit on or stand on, uh, I think we can all agree one thing we have learned is that people, humans, need other humans. It is not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Isolation, disconnection is what hermits do. Eccentric people do. People that have mental illness do that. If you want to avoid those things, you connect. And the problem is you're connecting with people because there's it's like going to church. There's a problem. There's people there. They screw the thing up, you know. It's like it was going to be good, and then there were people there. But, hey, it, it is how life works best. It is not good that man be alone. How many of you guys have been through in this room, have been through Financial Peace University that George and Rachel talked about? Wow, good. Gosh. In this room, it's about 30 or 40%. That's pretty cool. So that means in this room and watching all across America, the two or 300,000 of you watching, that there's really three kinds of folks at that, on that subject. There's ones that have been through Financial Peace University and have learned it and maybe know someone else that needs it. There's someone who's never been through it and, oh my goodness, 10 million folks have been through this. It's something you need to look at. It changes everything. It's the plan, the step-by-step -step process, the proven way of accomplishing these goals we've been talking about tonight. And of course, there's a third type, the one that went through financial peace university and needs to do it again. <laughs> that would be me. Uh, when I graduated from college, I was the portion of the class that allowed the top half to be possible. Um, yeah, I graduated, thank you, Laudy. And so, um, so uh, I, if that's you, I understand completely. Uh, but I'll tell you what, this process that we've honed in and if 10 million folks have gone through the class now, and millions and millions of millionaires, and now generationally, because we've been doing it so long, we're now meeting even third generations that are taking this material, this God's ways of handling money, grandma's common sense, the things we've been talking about tonight and applying them, and we're really, really seeing the results. It's um, nine lessons long, and so it takes nine weeks. If you do one lesson a week, that's how we've always done it traditionally, and that works best, really. You need to kind of absorb this and keep going through it. You don't do one lesson and nine years later do another lesson. You do them all in a row, right? And, uh, but it teaches you the things you were told about money or that you weren't told about money. See, a lot of people grew up in a household where their parents didn't talk about sex or money, and then they were surprised to find out they had both. <laughs> and so this is the place where you, you, know, you say, this is how it works. This is the class we all should have been taught. 
but have not been taught. That's what it amounts to. Our team's been working really hard. We have a new addition out, just came out last year. It involves Rachel teaching some of the classes, yay. George teaching some of the classes. Dr. John Deloney's in there. I'm still anchoring the deal. I'm running up and down the stage with my bald head yelling and flapping my arms. But um, you will leave motivated and you will leave with knowledge that you didn't have before and you will have to decide whether you agree with it or not. I will not leave you the option of being unclear. Uh, you'll know exactly what you're supposed to do and you will then choose if you're gonna do it or not because we can show you how to do this stuff. So when I first started teaching it, I taught it with an overhead projector and a bad suit. There were 30 people in the room and it was $526 to go through and we kept you in there for 26 weeks. By God, you were gonna learn it, you know? It was like boot camp, you know what I'm saying? People left crying every night, you know what I mean? It was like <laughs> hardcore. I'll do it, Dave, just don't, yeah, don't give me the scissors. I'll cut up my own credit cards, you know it's like, uh, But nowadays, it's a lot more sophisticated and a lot nicer, and you got Rachel. She's a lot nicer than I am. So, um, so tonight, we're going to do something we've never done. This is pretty cool. We're going to bundle a bunch of things together and give the best deal we've ever done in our lives um, because we really sense that there's a timing thing right now in this culture. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Don't be like those guys. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You gotta have new stuff in your brain to be something you've never been before, to do something you've never done before, to believe something you've never believed before. And I'm the same way. I have to constantly do this. I'm constantly reading. I have read three books this week. I was off goofing off since Christmas and I've been reading like crazy. I love it. It's just one of my favorite things in the world because it fires me up, man. It's amazing. So we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one coaching session when you buy Financial Peace University tonight. A one-on-one -on -one coaching session. You'll get to sit, talk to over the phone, one of our coaches and get into detail on your investments, on your debt, on you know, getting your spouse on board. How do I do the budget? I don't understand in my situation how to do it. We're gonna walk you through the little details because it gets kind of antsy, it gets kind of nerdy in there. And we're gonna walk you through it with one-on-one -on -one. and we're gonna give daily coaching calls, group coaching calls for a year. You can jump in up to once a day in group coaching calls and there'll be subjects like investing or budgeting or side hustles for extra money or whatever. You can jump in and every day, get a hold of a human being, because people need people, you need the connection. And we're, we've scaled this, we've got the ability to do it now, and I'm really excited about this, because this is the magic. It's not the information. If information had changed your life, you already, would have already done this, because the math is sixth grade. There's, the math is, this is not calculus, it's not trigonometry. You don't have to know the Pythagorean theorem to do this. I mean, you live on less than you make. This is a second grade activity, you know? But we have to have the situation and the people around us to do it, and that's why this coaching and this group coaching element is so, so important. Financial Peace University, of course, the nine-week class, the average person in all the years we've been doing this has a, in the first 90 days, has an $8,000 turnaround, $5,300 in debt paid off, $2,700 saved. That's an $8,000 change in the first 90 days because you get into it and you're game on and you're not thinking about nothing else. You know, like when you, look at, uh, you, when you look at green cars, all of a sudden you see green cars everywhere. You know, when you start doing this stuff, you're gonna find out there's people everywhere getting out of debt. And you're like, I thought I was, I thought there's nothing, nobody. There's a lot of people doing this. It's really a thing, you know? It, it's moving out there. So it's $79 if you just wanna go through the class. That's the normal price on it. Normal price on every dollar premium, which is the budgeting app. You can do it for free, but if you want to connect to your bank, it's 60 bucks a year, okay? So that's another 60 bucks to play, and we're going to throw in the every dollar premium. So one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, Financial Peace University, every dollar premium all together, all of that added up. It, it is a $500, $579 value if you added it all up. And tonight it's $69. Yeah. That's, it is the best deal I've ever put on a national stage like this ever since I've been doing this. I mean, we've sold it for $199, we've sold it for $226, we sold it for $526. I told you that when I started, because that was a little bit analog, to say the least. Uh, the, the Al Gore hadn't invented the internet at that point, and so, um, but the, uh, that's an old joke, but uh, still, still works. <laughs> The, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's that old. I've been doing this stuff a long time and I've gotten to see the results and I still get the letters and I still meet people who say this stuff saved my marriage and I'm like, hey, the sex class was down the hall, you know. But 
What we teach people to do is connect and communicate, have shared goals and communicate on their values and our why and why are we doing this? Why, are, why would we ever sell our car? Well, because it's killing us. Because all we do is fight about money. And every time I go to the grocery store, I'm, I have a freaking panic attack, but I'll go to an F-150, you know? It's, like, it's out of control, y'all. And so we got to confront the brutal facts, right? Do the, the, the Stockdale paradox and have faith that if I confront the brutal facts, the end of the story is going to be good. That's the faith part. And you step into that and you go, if I plant corn, there's a high likelihood corn's going to grow. If I plant nothing, there's a high likelihood of a mud puddle when it rains. And so if I do nothing, I'm going to keep, if I keep doing what I've been doing, I'm going to keep getting what I've been getting. It's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And, and so we all know this stuff. But sometimes we need someone to come alongside us, love us, care about us. We do. We care about you. And, and kick you in the butt because we love you. You know, I'm going to pop you upside the head. Straighten up, you know, because I love you. Not because I need to do it. But I want you to win, man. I want you to do this stuff. And so the other thing we're going to do is if you want to do two of these bundles, meaning you're going to go through it, or you're going to want to give away two of them, that's fine either way. Uh, we're going to do it for $99, and we're going to mail you a copy of the Total Money, our, the Baby Steps Millionaire is my latest number one bestseller, How Ordinary People Build Extraordinary Wealth and How You Can Too. And this is the whole study of millionaires that we did and the results that came from it. And we're going to show you from a Christian perspective, from a, uh, from a factual academic perspective, from a math perspective, and from case study perspective, and from 30 years of experience perspective, exactly why people become millionaires in America today. And hint, spoiler alert, they didn't inherit their money. That's the greatest lie the socialists have ever spread. And it's just, it's just a lie. It's a statistical lie. It's just not the truth. It's not, well, I don't like, agree with you. I don't care. You're wrong. You know, that, that's the point. I mean, we've got the data to prove this. This is proven. It is not in question anymore. So we can show you how to do this stuff. Now, one of the beautiful things about this is I get to meet people as I go all around the country. And I want to introduce you to two of my friends. They're absolutely incredible, George and Lisa. And they are, what you can do, by the way, if you want to do this $99 or you want to do the $69, you can just click on the QR code. Those of you watching at home, you can get that little phone thing out, do that QR code. Isn't it cool the QR code came back because of COVID? It almost died. And now the QR code's everywhere again, you know? It's like you had to do it for your menus, so now you do it for everything, you know? It's like, but uh, anyway, it's alive again. Who knew? And, um, but it's, it's working. So do the QR code, and that'll get you signed up. And, or you can go to RamseySolutions.com slash FPU. The $69, the $99 deal is there. Those of you in the room will have it here in the building for you after we're done and be able to sign books for you and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, just make sure that that's what we're doing. But I want to introduce you to George and Lisa. They're absolutely incredible. George has uh, worked for the uh, water department, the water treatment company there in Los Angeles. He worked one job is basically his whole life, or not, he worked at one place his whole life, worked several jobs working his way up through the thing, and just saving in his 401k, and uh, they ran into us about 2017, so about, what, five, six years ago now, and uh, they were most of their way into their millionaire process, and then when they took Financial Peace University, it just catapulted them the rest of the way through, but it's still just this incredible, sweet couple, and just a powerful story, so watch my friends George and Lisa. I told my wife, you know, I'm thinking about retiring. I'm running the numbers. She was, she goes, well, if you want to, you think you're ready. I go, yeah. I thought, oh, let me calculate this. You know, let's check out your 401k, how much is in there. And I, I told him, I think we're a millionaire. <laughs> I didn't believe her. <laughs> I work for a water treatment company. I was there for 40 years. And I started as a custodian, you know, 18-year-old kid, fresh out of high school. As I'm there working and I see that there's other jobs and I took some supervisory classes at the junior college and uh, I put in for the jobs, interview, prepared myself and, and I actually got the job. We had a, a, a 401k and so I started just 2%, you know, small. And then over time, little by little, every time I got a raise, I started increasing it till I maxed it out to the most that I could. And I don't want to say that everything was peaches and roses. I mean, yes, we made mistakes along the way, but in spite of those, the goal was to 
pay off our house and be debt free. If you think it can't happen or won't happen, it probably won't. So you gotta get out of that way of thinking and just say, I wanna try something different. If it wasn't for that, I probably would have stayed at the store then. I mean, it sounds so simple, but everything you do can just take you another step forward if you're intentional about saving. If you try to say, I'm gonna be a millionaire tomorrow, then it's like, okay, that's why they call it baby steps. When you do one step at a time, you see progress. From custodian to maintenance worker, station mechanic, instrument technician to supervisor. And now I'm worth 1.1 million. If I can do it, you can do it. Well, there's two new faces here on the stage with us. Right here is best-selling author and host of the Ken Coleman Show, Ken Coleman. <laughs> and then next to him is best-selling author, host of the Dr. John Deloney Show, Dr. John Deloney. So every year, uh, people come out with their predictions of trends that are going to be happening in the upcoming year. So People? What people? People, experts. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you, there's a lot of articles that come out, and they're like, oh, hey, here's going to be the trends that you're possibly going to see. And that's in money, that's in health, all the things. So we thought it'd be fun to pick out a few of the trends that we've heard about and kind of talk through and think, okay, is this... Legitimate? Do we think we're really going to see this in 2023? So I'll start us off. Please. So the the uh, trend that I saw that I just related to, and you guys appreciate that because of my Disney story, is a thing that people are predicting that revenge travel is going to be at an all-time high. Re revenge travel? Explain that. Revenge yeah, I, travel, I, I, yep. I don't, I don't know what this is. So revenge travel, they're it's saying... It's like Liam Neeson and Taken? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Got skills. It's because that people were not able to travel for, you know, two years. And now they have this pent-up tension. They're like, we want to get out. We want to get out. We don't care what it costs. We're going to travel. We're going to see the world. We're going to take our families. And more than ever, they're saying the travel industry is going to be... Pew. Well, they got time because they quit their job. <laughs> Who are they revenging? It's so dramatic. I had the, the same world, thought. The Ooh, economy. I don't I'll know. show you. I'm going to go spend money. <laughs> I think it's going to be a thing, though. I mean, I'm booking... You already, yeah, you already can't get a reservation place. Well, I'm booking oh. travel right now, and I'm like, number one, it's so expensive. Airports it's so... Cool. Not just the airlines, but the hotels, everything. They're I'm damned. like, it's so expensive right now. That was the worst time. Just stay home. Here's the thing. Add up how much you spend just to live in your house. And I'm like, that's a hotel stay. I enjoy it. Why go anywhere? <laughs> you fun. have you have one of... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, wait a second. Wait a second. No, no, no. 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 Don't clap for him. Like He's, he's like neurotic, budget. It's all neurosis. <laughs> he's not okay. The You're guy walks bucks around with any back in a holster. <laughs> <laughs> that went okay. well. That's my, that's my trend, and I think you're going to see it. So when okay. you guys start to see travel go crazy, you're going to say, Rachel Cruz was right. Okay. George, what's your trend? Wow. Okay. So the trend we're seeing right now is sky-high interest rates with credit cards. We're seeing it with car loans. We're seeing it in the housing market. And so because of that, we're going to see a huge spike in consumer debt, which means people will turn to terrible options like buy now, pay later. So I think we're going to see a huge spike, especially with younger generations turning to buy now, pay later, where they put everything on four payments, what right? Are the, what are those companies called? The, the, the fintech company? Afterpay. Klarna, Afterpay, Klarna, Afterpay Affirm, yeah. Zezzle. It's so cute billion. that they think they invented this. I found a newspaper the other day. We were cleaning out our house. We're moving when Nixon resigned. What, 1972 or four or something How like that? old are you? keep you? those I'm newspapers? Old. I'm old. I was, I was a kid when it happened. Shut up. But... Um, <laughs> But anyway, I had the newspaper. I, I still kept it because it's a keepsake. And, and but I was I got to thumbing through the classifieds and the the you know the car ads are hilarious. The Pinto is for sale, right? You know, the world's worst car ever made, except possibly some of those American Motors Gremlins. But the uh, um, you know so I found that stuff. But also it's still e three easy payments. Oh yeah, like freaking Klarna because it's on your iPhone. Invented it. That's crap. Well, here's the craziest part. That. They they're they getting these young generations. They just made it new. It's like layaway, right? I remember. Yeah. Layaway. 
layaway when I was a kid. Yeah, but layaway, they don't penalize you. This crap penalizes right. you. Here's how stupid these people are. They're financing a pizza. Four payments on a pizza. And you add it to your tab, right? Well, I was buying a T-shirt with a funny saying on it, and they offered me payments Underneath, on it. right? Y'all okay, seen it? George, though, but I feel, like there, I feel like there's been stuff out now, now that those companies actually are losing value. Like, they're not doing as well. Well, there's more competition in that space, and so now it's a okay. fight for market share with the retailers. And they're, yeah, they're ripping the consumer a new one for sure. And there's all kinds of traps, right? They promise the 0% on your four payments, but there's all kinds of fees, and it triggers interest. But here's the big kicker. Klarna brags to retailers that if they use their, their uh, program, consumers will spend up to 45% more. So I'm less worried about the fees. I'm more worried about a generation that's broke because they spent 45% more because you don't feel it when it's over four payments. You want fries with your T-shirt. Yeah. It's insane. So that's my trend. There you go. Uh, take it or leave it. I'll take Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. I like, I like that. Yeah, you know, so we've had a couple things that are leading to this trend over the last several years. One is obviously the skyrocketing cost of college tuition. In our Borrowed Future documentary, we really expose that in a powerful way. So that's been happening for some time, right? Decades, and it just keeps getting more and more expensive. Well, then the pandemic hits, and all these colleges and universities are most send everybody home, but the tuition is the same. So now the kids and the parents who've kind of thought, well, this is the golden ticket to success, they start to question the ROI, the return on investment. So that's happening, okay? And then you've got corporate America over the last decade they're beginning to see that kids are coming out of colleges and universities and they're really not qualified to do the job and they're having to train them anyway. Then, so, that, so that's, that's kind of one storm altogether. Then this other storm that's happening uh, that's on the horizon and it's coming fast is, is that we've got 4 million less people in the workforce after the pandemic. So they just chose optional retirement. But the pandemic spun off 4 million new jobs. And that's why we have, if you watch the news, you're seeing stuff, you hear talk about the labor shortage, all right? We're not gonna get an egghead and nerdy. But what that means is, is that companies are desperate for people. And they're looking for people. The great resignation has started to happen. Dave talked about that earlier tonight. And the, 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 the crazy numbers of people that have just switched jobs. So all this turnover, plus a shortage of people, has companies going, you know what? We're going to change the old school way of thinking that said, if you don't have a college degree, no need to apply. And that is changing rapidly. I'll give you a real example. Big companies like Delta, the largest airline in the world, over 50% of their jobs don't require a college degree. That's a big shift. IBM, Big Blue, we're talking about one of the gold standard technology companies, is now have about 40 to 50% of their jobs not requiring a degree. And their CEO recently told Fortune Magazine this, and, and this is why the trend is happening. He said, we did an internal study and we found that our employees that had no degree performed just as well as our people with PhDs. Now, on the count of three, Sorry, I want us to... Sorry, John. That's right. <laughs> Hashtag off. No, 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 no. But seriously, on the count of three, I want us to all say, duh. One, two, three. Duh. duh. Yeah, really. I mean, small business has known this for years. Yes, it's not I've a never new hired thing. Any, I've got 1,100 people working here. I've never hired somebody because of where they went to school, yeah, right. and I've never not hired them because they didn't have a degree. I didn't hire them because I didn't think they could do the job. Right. Sure, but and there are fields that you have to... Absolutely. Ha okay. Well, yeah, I, yeah, not yeah. questioning it. What I'm saying is... going to do accounting that you've yeah. got an accounting so, degree, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> or like my brain surgeon, like, yeah, I, I got this, bro. I got this. <laughs> You're like, I watched a YouTube video. I watched a YouTube video. Yeah. Stayed the Holiday Inn last night. Yeah. Right. Although, we never ask him where he got never. his degree. Never. So here's, right. here's the payoff. What does that mean for you all, and why do I bring this trend up? It is leveling the playing field. Yeah. If you don't have a degree or you don't have a fancy degree... No the more game, whining. No degree required. Go get you some money. It is changing the game, changing the game. And as a result of that, the mini trend, the mini trend, I'm sorry, I'm fired up. I've been it's a lot of trends. For, I've been waiting for one. four hours. All right, I gotta say something. <laughs> All right, listen, here's the deal. And that's, what's really exciting is the trades are exploding. You're going to see more people moving to the trades. You're going to see white-collar workers. I took a call today on the Ken Coleman Show. The guy wants to walk away from a white-collar job and get into the trades to become a small businessman. That's America. That's good. That's exciting. Woo. Makes our friend Mike Rowe really excited. Can you follow that up, John? No. <laughs> I... I think I'm going to go a little more bold. I think in, um, I think in 2023, I just, I was just, I think, I think the Macarena returns as the dance to do. Yes. Do it, John. Do 
Oh, no way. No, I, I think... Um, it feels right, John. It feels time. right. I think TikTok hey, could do it. They yeah. could bring it back single-handedly. Are you willing to start it? Are you willing to start it on Instagram Reels tonight? I can't move my... my see, here's the thing. When my, when my arms move, my hips freeze. Mm. And then when my hips move, people call the cops. It's a whole thing. So I'm just going to put out... Here's what I think. I think that... Um, Self-awareness is good. Yeah. So I... Uh, I'm a direct beneficiary of therapy and counseling. It's changed my life. It saved my life. Um, there was a season when I had a close friend who was a medical doctor, and he walked me through using medication. So it, it was transformative. Okay. So I say all that up front to say this. Um, if you step back and look at, I'll just say the United States, we've got more people, millions and millions and millions of people in counseling. We have millions and millions and millions of people medicated and the problems of anxiety and depression continue to escalate when when they discovered penicillin death from infections fell off the table that solved that problem what we are trying to do what we're throwing at anxiety we're throwing at depression we're throwing at this chaos isn't it's holding it at bay it's giving people different roads and opportunities the problems continue to escalate and i think we have a culture that is completely um, the engine that drives the culture is, you might die tomorrow, you might die, you might die, you might die, you might die, you might die. You might die. And so I think uh, my prediction for, for this year is I think we've got another six to nine months of continued mental health challenges until we finally have this terrifying, it's all coming down recession, or we have something that we all experience together, and then we're gonna go to sleep, and we're gonna wake up, and the sun will have come out, and we'll go, huh, I'm a little bit stronger than I thought. Or we're going to get laid off, and I'm just going to say, I'm going to follow what Ken just said. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go this way this time, and I'm going to find a new job, and I'm going to realize I'm a lot stronger than I was, I'm a lot tougher than I was. I had more people in my corner than I ever imagined, and that's resilience. And that's when our minds start to go, oh, you're driving now. I don't need to set these alarms. All anxiety is is an alarm system, right? We don't have to ring the alarms off the hook anymore because you're back in the driver's seat. And I think, um, and I'll, I'll pitch you here, Dave. I think the my, would you call it a mini, mini prediction? Um, right as I left the university setting to come uh, be, a, <laughs> be a YouTuber, my, my students were starting this thing quietly. And they would go out to eat together or they'd go grab drinks and nachos or whatever, and they would all stack up their cell phones, and the first person to grab it had to pay for the meal. And it was leaving, leave it to college kids, leave it to the younger generations to both amplify the current culture, but to also say, I'm not living like that. And so I, I think we are rounding a corner that um, people are going to have to start looking each other in the I, eye. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sitting here just observing, I got three teens, and just kind of observing everything that we observe. I, I, when you say that, that is incredibly hopeful, but I'm just, I've never asked you this. The fear mongering that we see on whatever your favorite news website is, or whatever Twitter account you follow, I mean, it is just negative, negative, negative. We've never had more news, we've never had more access to information. How much is that playing into this onslaught of anxiety that we're just constantly being told that the world is falling apart? Our, we're running on ancient technology, right? This design to tell us there's a bear at the front of a cave. And maybe in the course of your lifetime, there would be two or three bears. And it would say, fight that bear or run from that bear or play dead. And that bear will gnaw off one of your legs and drag you out under a pile of leaves. And then you can live to fight another day, right? That's it. One That's I was it. hoping the bear would just lick you and run away. That's, you went really deep yeah, with that one. There. So Good. now, like I said, our cur the, the engine that drives our culture is fear. And so they're telling you there's a there's a, there's a bear in your toothpaste. Do you know what's in that toothpaste? It's going to kill your teeth. It's going to fall out of your head. And then you quit brushing your teeth. It's like, oh, bad breath is going to lead to heart disease. Dead. And then it's like, oh, you wear shoes. You should be barefoot. Oh, you wear barefoot. Your knees are going to fall. There are bears everywhere. And our brains are just going, and it's just fried. It's like we're putting our study out every day that contradicts the study from the day before. That's right. That's right. That's why we drink, America. All right? No, I'm just kidding. Kidding, 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 kidding. You know what I've decided, John, that I don't care what they come up with. I'm eating bacon all, all day all day all day that's america forever forever hey here's here's why i'm 
Hey, here's why I'm hopeful. I hope it's okay to share this, the, 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 the number. Um, a year ago, or two years ago, right before I took this job, uh, my buddy, I, I called my buddy, he was on the board at Apple and Google, he was a, is a smart guy, he's a brilliant, lovely guy, and I said, hey, what's the book that hasn't been written yet? Like, there's so much noise out in the world, and before I, I leave what I know and take this other job, what's a book you would like to read? And he said, well, I've read all the studies that say technology's killing my family, so I took away all the screens, and now me and my three daughters are just sitting here in the living room staring at each other, what do I do now? And I go, ha, ha, just talk to him. And he goes, okay, I'll just talk to him. And he is like, oh, what do I do now? And so we created these little questions for humans, which is a deck of cards with questions that are designed to get you past the first and second layer. It became, we sold over a million dollars worth of cards. They have taken off in a bananas way. And here's why. There's nothing sophisticated about these things. I assure you, you should be in some of the planning meetings. They get really dark, right? <laughs> but people have an excuse and they talk to their kids or they talk to their grandkids or they talk to their husband or wife, not just about what Billy did at school and what's all going on, our retirement's down, but what's a story from middle school that you've never told me? And they, I didn't So it was one time at band camp. Exactly. See? <laughs> So I think that oh, we were well, there bacon involved. People are experiencing human connection, and I, I'm I'm just convinced that people are going to say, "I want to choose a non-anxious life," and that well, as a culture, we'll, we'll we'll make a turn. Good work. Good. And Dave, that kind of leads into yeah, I mean, it, into your trend. Exactly. And I, you're seeing. In all fairness, we spend so much time together that, and we are sitting on the show together three hours a day answering questions, uh, different ones of us, you know, these are some of our Ramsey personalities, There's also Christina Ellis and Jade Warshaw now, and, uh, but we're, you know, these ideas I'm learning from Deloney, he's learning from me, I'm learning from Ken on what's happening in the career field, you know, we're all bouncing ideas back and forth, they teach me about culture, I don't even know what it is, um, uh, current culture anyway, and so, um, I mean, get anything past Jerry Rafferty, I have trouble, right, but the, uh, um, 1980 something, but, who? The, yeah, that, who, who, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, he I was, was the best butter churner in 1804. He yeah, was the best. So, thank you very much, John. But the, uh, um, if any of y'all are hiring, I'll, I'll, I would like to talk to you. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great resignation. I can I think see if the, the trend future, of Dave age insults keeps up that, uh, John won't be here in 2024. <laughs> it was a new trend. It's a good yeah. prediction. Uh, I, I'm, it's easy. I'm good with that. The, I, I but I do, I, I told a group of business leaders at our entree leadership thing, uh, almost a year ago now, I said, I think, I really sense, and I, I, I just our finger on the pulse of our customers, and we deal with tens of millions of people in a given week with our different podcasts and the different connectivity points, is what John's saying is right on, that there's a relationship revolution coming, uh, that people are getting sick and tired of the, the benefit of technology is still there, and I'm not saying technology is evil, it's not in and of itself but the uses of it and what it's doing to people's sleep patterns, what it's doing to youngsters' development. Um, the, what you used to have to do if you were a 14-year-old boy to get a hold of porn was you had to go to extraordinary lengths, and now he walks around with it in his hand. And, and the porn addiction is a dirty little secret in America. I mean, it's the fastest growing addiction out there. We're seeing people's houses lost, lives destroyed, marriage just ripped apart. It's fast, the fastest growing addiction in North America. More it's money rewiring spent. Rewiring young people. Rewiring the brains to where there's all kinds of sexual dysfunction in their head, in their marriages later that they can't get past. It's huge. And it's, just, it's the evil use of this technology. This technology has good uses. It's a wonderful thing. I can look at the weather and not get hit by a tornado, right? It's a good thing. But, um, but, but it's out of control. And, and we've tried to use it like a magic wand instead of connecting to humans, the dirty, messy work of loving other people well, the unlovable, which we all are, at our core, unlovable, and someone to love them well. Instead, we bury our head in someone else's fantasy and they're real on Instagram or worse. And uh, so this, it's breaking, it's, it's, it's falling apart. And people are realizing it, so they're gonna put it down. They're not gonna put the whole thing down. So different people are gonna say, okay, this at least limit the amount of hours on screen or before bedtime because it's messing up your sleep patterns or whatever it is. They're gonna start doing this and we're gonna see a relationship revolution. And what I'm saying is, is we're gonna realize Facebook friends aren't Friends, 
They don't come, they won't help you change your tire at 2 a.m. Not one of them will show up, you know, and work for home doesn't work while you're at home. And online connectivity isn't connected, really. I mean, if you can't get where you can look in someone's eyes and sense their body language and hear the pace of their voice and you just paused, I just heard you lie and I love you enough and I'm going to call you out on it. I'm going to call you on your stuff right now because you're my friend and I'm not putting up with you acting that way. That does not happen online. But that's a good friend. That's a man walking with a man, a woman walking with a woman and and you know, sit down and go, you're getting ready to screw your marriage up. I can see it all over you. You need to stop. And that does, that you can't do that. You can't love people well in, in, with these things. They're good for other stuff. They're magic wand. They'll put stuff on your porch with one click. But, but it, they won't change your life. People change your life. So I, I see a relationship revolution beginning, and I hope it begins in, 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 you know, with a passion starting tonight right now. I love that. So good. That's great. Well, I've, I thought, I was like, we should all come back in December and just see if the trends, what we thought of the year, right? Yeah. With the tre- are the trends going? Well, one trend, George, that I hope continues to increase. We're going to do a What's shameless that, plug Rachel? here. That our podcast, George Smart Money Happy Hour. Boy, we didn't rehearse that one. Continues on. Obviously. That's but not, as we were talking about this panel. We talk about it all the time. John's <laughs> jealous because he doesn't get invited to the party. That is true. He got invited once. And never back. And never again. We won't That's come right. back again. That's right. No. <laughs> No, but we were talking about this panel. I was like, George, we should do something fun from our yes. podcast. So we have fun on our podcast. For those of you that don't know, we've got this new podcast called Smart Money Happy Hour. It's me and Rachel, two friends who happen to be money experts. It's very casual. It's funny. It's helpful. And part of that, at the end, we do a segment called Guilty as Charged, where our producer tees up a question. And if you're guilty, you know, you got to share the story. And so I wanted to ask one to the, for the good of the group to end on a light note. And that is... What is the purchase you shamelessly love that others would find embarrassing? John? I imagine your list is plentiful. I didn't hear what you said. Do what? I was too, I was too excited about this new podcast called the Smart Money Happy Hour. Have you guys heard of it? Wait, what were you saying? It's on the screen, John. Just look at it. I'm not going to repeat it. He's pitching you the question. What is it? What, what, what is, is the, the purchase, purchase you shamelessly well, love? Reading, Ken, what's the purchase? That others would find embarrassing. I honestly was looking for a little bit of clarification because how do I know that it's embarrassing for someone? We'll tell else? you. Oh, I we'll see. We'll tell you. We'll tell you. Yeah, this I crowd mean, you is kind of know. Like, what's the thing? Yes. Here's, you, I'm not ashamed of this. Yes. Listen to this. So I was on the road. We were doing, I think we're doing this event in, uh, I think in California. I didn't pack. I didn't pack any underwear. I didn't. And so I had to go to the nearest place, and I like fancy. I, there was no fancy. And I went to Walmart. Definitely and it's, no fancy. it's the best underwear I've ever worn in my life. <laughs> and I think it's called, like, like Dan or George or something. You're it's right. incredible. You find this embarrassing. You're right. <laughs> Do what? All right. I'm all about it. That's what I'm saying. I have, a, I have other lists in my mind. I, like, I'm thinking of seven things that you own that I think are very... What's strange. one? What? One is, John has these earbuds that shoot light into his brain that apparently give him vitamin D. Stop. You, you fell for One that? of us is over six feet tall. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> hey, don't applaud that. For too long, John has thought that being tall is a personality trait. It's not. I'm sorry. And you're actually not that tall. It's just we're short. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think that's vitamin D, John. You should probably check that receipt. <laughs> doctor. You should my, see wife told doctor. Me she, my wife told me she's going to bury me. She goes, I'm gonna, when you die, I'm going to bury you in all those stupid gadgets you have. It's anyway. Yeah. There we right. go. I, the only one, I really can't think of anything out of this, but this will embarrass Dave. And so this, oh, good. my answer will embarrass Dave. It's embarrassing before. It really irritates him. So enjoy this. Uh, years ago, years ago, I mean, gee whiz, I don't know, Josie's 14, so we, we have two, we adopted two boys and a biological daughter, and so we've only been through pregnancy once, and Stacey went through the whole thing, and she brought home one night uh, a full-length body pillow, 
you know, for her to sleep, you know, to help make her more comfortable being pregnant. Some women are shaking their head. You know what I'm talking about. And I remember when she told me about it, I was like, huh, that's an interesting concept. And I saw her sleep with it. And I I remember going, I really want to try that. (laughs) And I, I have, uh, you know, Dave knows that I have no calf muscle and I don't paint my pants on like George, but I'm still wearing skinny jeans and I got room in them. I got the littlest legs you've ever seen in your life. And, and, and so I have bony knees and bony ankles and my whole life I've never really felt comfortable. And in that moment, it was a realization that my knees and ankles never have to touch. And so she went out of town with her mom, God is my witness, and I was there. And I went to bed that night and I saw her pillow and I went. Amazon delivery. And I slept with that full body pillow and it changed my life. And 14 years straight, she bought me one and I still sleep with a body pillow. You're right. You're You're so brave. Ken, between that and you eating bacon, you're the most courageous guy I know. Thank you, Ken, for your honesty. Well, I knew that Dave would be embarrassed, and I felt like that qualified. But by the way, don't knock it until you've tried it. (laughs) My spine is straight. My knees are perfectly apart. Oh, by the way, it's long enough that my elbows go as well. I get all the way to the elbows. Enough already. Enough bacon breath. Enough, really. Our live stream right. is tuned out, Ken. They're we done. Gotta, we got to keep going. I don't think, I, I, I'm really trying to think. I have, a li- I have a light bulb in one of our lamps that has an app to it that changes color. That's embarrassing to you? I don't know, maybe. Wow. A, a Tesla, an electric car, a Dave. Tesla. That's embarrassing to him. There we go. Dave hates electric cars. Rachel's Tesla is something uh, she shamelessly loves that others would find embarrassing. You would never be caught dead in it. He's like, it's a battery with wheels. I'm like, I'm not paying for gas. <laughs> I know I am. You plug in out here. I know, I get, I do, I get to plug hey. in at work. And Dave's paying for the bill. <laughs> Every day I drive into work and I see all these electric cars all plugged in. Free, like no and I know that Dave's free. paying for their gas yeah. and I just go, ah, yes, I love it. Got him. All right, I'm going to go, for me, I'm going to go motion sensor, toilet, night light. <laughs> if you know, you know. Here's the, here's the sales pitch. It's 3 a.m., you're going to the bathroom. You don't want to flip on all the lights. That's going to keep you up for a few more hours, wake up the rest of the family. The motion sensor nightlight, you get within five feet of that thing, the bowl is perfectly lit. You go back to bed. I think that's actually great. Ten bucks on Amazon, change my life, change my family tree. You stubbed it. I gotta tell you, I got no problems with it. How did, he, how did he get through the interview process? I'll tell you how, it took zero PhDs, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I know. Oh, watch out. I, <laughs> he made the tall joke. I had to get no. him back. Here's the thing. It's so weird. Um, I, I, I'm, ju- I'm just trying to say this in the right way. <laughs> Dude, I think I, got you. Got I don't it. need my path lit. I can, I get, my aim is true is what I will say. <laughs> You're telling me you've never stubbed your toe on the way? Trying you, to- I, I thought you were going to say dog bed. The pet ramp was very, very controversial <laughs> to John and Ken. I will not get into the pet ramp. I it- would have joined that group. Yeah. Buddy wants to know what Dave. <laughs> All right, Dave. Right. I don't know. I'm trying to think. No, no, I just you don't- have to tell oh. us. I, I mean, I, mainly what it would be would just be the volume of something I do that would be embarrassing. Like, I, you know, if I want to get, if I start collecting something, I collect way too much of it. Mm. Like I started doing old water skis, antique water skis, and now like they're, they filled up the whole freaking basement and my wife's like, they're killing me. They hit the car. This is all, and, and they're everywhere. They're like, they're, you know, so everything I do, I just, yeah, I go OCD weird. and I, you know, I've got, well, no, but I mean, you know, whatever else, you know, gun collection, way too many firearms. Way too many firearms. What's the thing shared? There's not going to be a war. No, no, no. You Nobody's think like, you think like, no, no. It's a lot. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I just, whatever it is, the amount is what's embarrassing. I just don't. That's fair. I don't, I don't turn it off. I mean, yeah. I got like three pair of jeans. I'm good with that. But when I do something else, there's 8,000 of them. You know, whatever it is, you know, it's like, and, and I got too many cars. You know, I have too many of this, you know, and, and it's just like, it, it's just, it's stupid. It, Contentment. It, it, Mm. It's a well, great, powerful breath. No, it's not, about, it's not about contentment. It's not like it's bringing me joy. It's just I'm OCD and I can't stop. 
Just once keep I going. Start, once I started, I'm just like, I got in there. Okay, that's yeah. good. I think we were all guilty. I think we all had. Yeah. I think yeah. we all fair answered it because sometimes. Well, we're you, all human. I have no guilt about the body pillow. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone works for George Underwear, I would like to you to sponsor my show. <laughs> New sponsorship. Really Be a sponsor. Be a sponsor. Really not called George. Also, There's please no don't way. say George no, Underwear. Is. No, it just says a blanket statement. I realize how that can Very be confusing. <laughs> This evening can go sideways. He's going to tackle you if you stood up and tried to show us. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going to wrap us up here. Take gentlemen. us to glory. Yes. I think you're well, welcome to a Ramsey staff meeting. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, that was fantastic. Okay, to wrap us up, though, tonight, for real. Uh, Dave, I'd love, um, as we end, just to give a piece of encouragement, right? We're entering a new year. We've talked about fears. We've talked about good habits, what to do to build wealth. Uh, there's been a lot of information tonight, so end us this event with just some encouragement and some hope. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, I, I think for sure, this idea that you step back and you get perspective. Uh, what Rachel was showing you, for instance, on the graphs with the S and P 500, or you step back and it, it, it is one of the uh, benefits of getting old. Is I know I didn't die from that. That I thought that thing was going to be the end of the world. It wasn't. That was, that was going to be, no, that's not the end of the world. And that was going to be the end of the world. And the number of times that I've had people predict that Jesus was coming back on a certain year, and it didn't happen, you know? I mean, I just, they're all wrong, apparently. And so um, uh, they don't know, in other words, which the Bible says that. But the, the point being is uh, we get caught up in the drama of the moment, and when you step back from it and put it in perspective, it, it's silly. It's almost humorous. Uh, what we were losing our hope over, what we were losing our minds over, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. Because, uh, you know, I mean, that, I'm going to lose the truck. It's a truck. There's a lot of them. You know, you'll get another one. I mean, I've been to a lot of funerals. I've never saw, seen a rider truck fall on a hearse. You know, you're not taking it with you. It's just stuff. And so stepping back and going, all right, there's some things here that are really important that I'm willing to sacrifice for and other people aren't going to understand and I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not, I'm not taking a poll here. This is not a popularity contest. We're going to do it anyway. And that's that hope that comes from perspective is what we want for all of you. It's why we did this tonight. It's what everything is telling us from the culture right now that's going on that we needed to tell y'all tonight. And that's why we came. That's why we wanted to do this for a couple hundred thousand people online and a thousand or so here in our building. And it's why we'll be on the air tomorrow on the Ramsey Show doing the exact same thing again. Not this material, but we're going to be telling you, it's okay, you're gonna get there. You've gotta follow proven principles. You cannot violate the law of gravity and expect anything but pain. Don't do it, it hurts, it's stupid. Don't do it. You're not stupid, but you're doing stupid. Stop it. And it gives people hope and clarity. And, uh, and that's what we wanted to do tonight. And I, th and I hope, I pray we've done that. If not, leave here knowing that that's available to you, that you've just got to reach and get it. Thanks for being here tonight, everybody. God bless y'all.